warm and pleasant welcome to the Emirates MBD Global Business Series, an initiative by the SPI Group and the Intelligent SME. The Emirates NBD Global Business Series is one of its kind occasion to meet business icons such as the one we have today, corporate executives and dynamic business leaders. I think that's the term that best epitomizes Mr. Ahmed bin Salim this evening. The sole purpose of this event is to inspire entrepreneurs and senior executives with profound insights and guidance from these icons, which would help in climbing the ladder towards success and fulfill their aspirations. We understand a lot of you are from the SME industry, and this is our way of giving back to you. But the successful journey of Intelligent SME and SPI Group would not be possible without the consistent support of our sponsors partners and our well-wishers, so a quick moment to remember them all. Starting with our Strategic Alliance partners, Dubai SME, and our title sponsors, Emirates NBD. We also thank our gold sponsor, Porsche Center Dubai Al Nabuda Automobiles. The car that you saw on display, probably if you had a valet done, was the Panamera 4S Executive. It's example of the Porsche philosophy of intelligent performance, which makes it perfect for this evening as well. What's more, you can avail special privileges on the Panamera by contacting the Porsche ambassador, Mr. Matthias Henkos. We would also uh, like to thank and extend our gratitude to our technology partner, SAP Middle East and North Africa. Our alliance partners, Western Union Business Solutions, Al Nabuda Insurance Brokers, Petrochem Middle East, AIG SME Insurance Solutions, and our media partners, College Times, Star Plus, and Life OK. In addition, we would also like to thank Bryce Group for supporting our initiative. The Bryce Head of Sales and Distribution, Emirates NBD to the stage to felicitate Mr. Salim. <laughs> Following Mr. Shantanu AP, the dynamic CEO of uh, SPI Group. So if you could please uh, get on the stage and give Mr. Ahmed bin Salim his memento. We also have a special uh, gift of appreciation from Porsche Al Nabuda Center Automobile that Mr. Shantanu will give away to our guest of honor. Um, without further ado, I would like to in uh, introduce our moderator for this evening. Tariq Qureshi is the founder and CEO of Vantage Holdings. He's also the media representative and advisor for Bloomberg TV and multimedia in the Middle East. Tariq's media and broadcasting experience includes radio, TV, print, speaker, panelist, and moderating specially conference uh, sessions like today. So Tariq, the stage is all yours, and I think I should give this to you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, it's a full house, it's a lovely evening, and uh, we are good to go. So what I'm gonna do today, uh, while uh, Ahmed is getting uh, mic'd up, is just spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about the man and some of his achievements just to set the tone and set the context of this evening. You see some beautiful photographs there uh, in his younger days and in his, uh, in the days when he didn't have his beard. Actually, no, you do have a beard there. Uh, <laughs> are we gonna talk about your beard very soon? I can, I can talk about that too, okay. Um, but beyond that, I think what is important is to look at some of the things that uh, Ahmed has done. Uh, he went to university in California, so I guess uh, he connected with Kobe Bryant, who is, a, is an amazing uh, uh, basketball player, and this is obviously one of uh, Ahmed's passions. As you can see, he's still there. Uh, and he also is an MC, just like me, so he actually ran the, the program there. Um, a very proud moment uh, with uh, Sheikh Mohammed, and I think we will talk about that in terms of when uh, he created the gold bullion coins and commemorated that, so with Sheikh Mohammed himself. Um, what I'd like to do is to put a little backdrop, because we hear a lot of things about DMCC and, uh, and the JLT uh, Free Zone Authority, but when we really dig deeper uh, that is when we understand the true achievement of this gentleman. And he's been there, actually he was there six months before it even was officially opened. He joined as a director. But let me just put you, give you a couple of statistics on the positioning of DMCC and then we can just move from there. 
This is 25 years ago. Actually, this is when I arrived in, uh, in Dubai in, in 1987, and I just graduated and I came down here. And this is exactly what I remember. Uh, that's the Al Rustamani building, and the defense roundabout, that was the Sheikh Rashid uh, building. So that gives you a context of how far Dubai has come, and, and, the, and you will see the context as we go forward. Uh, this is going for even further back. That's about 45, 50 years ago, when just around the time of uh, UAE's independence. This is uh, the Buy Gold Exchange. Uh, and when you go to the souk, this is what it used to look like. What is important is to see how the Buy Multi Commodities Center became as a global trading center. It is now the third largest diamond trading center in the world. So when you drill deeper into it, you understand why. Dubai as a microcosm, as a crossroads that is standing there, it actually focuses very, very much on Africa. And you can see a lot of the diamond areas that are there. And that is one of the catchment areas for uh, DMCC. And we'll talk about that today. This is uh, Ahmed's, one of Ahmed's pride and joys, uh, the Almas Tower. But what's important to see there is where it came from. That was the hole in the ground on which he produced Almas Tower. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's actually, you know, when you step back and you think about it, this is not very long ago. What, when was this, 2005, 2006? Actually, this is a mine in uh, Russia. But, uh, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> is it? They gave you the wrong picture. <laughs> OK. So that's Almas Tower and a mine in Russia. <laughs> This is what it is today. It is spectacular. It's a beautiful picture, but you just, it's, and if you've done one of these sea wing flights and stuff like that, you'll actually see uh, the MCC and JLT in its true, true glory. Um, we'll talk about 2009 when there was a financial crisis because that was a time when uh, Ahmed's courage and Ahmed's focus and intensity came through. And how he saw that through. And I think for a lot of entrepreneurs here, looking at crisis points and then bouncing back from there is one of the key things that we need to, uh, to, to talk about today. And you can ask questions. And he's you know, refreshingly very, very open and, and ready to answer all the questions. Uh, the buy diamond trade has just exploded. It's, uh, 10 years ago, it was about 18, 20 million. But today, the, the volume of, of trading on the Dubai Diamond Exchange is in excess of 40 billion. So how do you go from 20 million to 40 billion in less than 10 years? I have no idea, and I'm sure he's going to tell you how you scale like that. Uh, and the last one is that Africa is looking towards Dubai. And Dubai is looking towards Africa, particularly when it comes to diamond, key trading, and various other things. So we will certainly talk like about Africa. So I won't bore you anymore because I feel that I wanted to set the context with you is not just the man but also his achievements. We've done that. Now I'll uh, invite uh, Ahmed to say a few words, get the, th the tone uh, from his side and then we'll bang straight into a Q&A session. Usually people who are loud are short men I guess. Uh, for those of you who uh, may have not seen me or known me before. I'm the executive chairman of Dubai Multi Commodity Center. I'm the former vice chair of the Dubai Diamond Exchange. I'm a director currently at Dubai Diamond Exchange. Uh, I am the uh, chairman of Dubai Diamond Gold and Commodities Exchange. Uh, that's an interesting exchange, which I will. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, this is an interesting and momentous date for us today. Today is the first launch of Dubai Gold and Commodities Exchange of the Plastics Future. A risky contract, a contract that failed in London Metals Exchange. And, when it, and we took the risk and we're going to push forward. And when DGCX launches a contract, we make sure the market makers are in place, demand is there before we even think about it. We triple check. So we'll be following the uh, plastic futures. In addition to our leading uh, contract, the Indian rupee future, which is the first one to be listed in the world before even India, Indian future contract. There was only Indian rupee um, forwards in Singapore. 
I will do my best to give some background about DMCC. Dubai Multi Commodity Center, or at that time it was called Dubai Metals and Commodity Center, was an initiative that everyone shied away from. And I don't blame them. If I was there with this experience and I had to go through what I had to go through, and someone tells me, here's a barren land, almost an hour away or 40 minutes away from the gold souk, and we'd like you to work with the team to establish a commodities uh, center with, with gold as the benchmark, gold refining. If I had the connection and network I have today, I might say, no, I'm, I'm happy in the hotel business or property business or whatever. I wouldn't go with it. Even today, I would say no. See, His Highness took a risk, even though this initiative failed so many times before, say so failed so many times after with people trying to emulate what DMCC has achieved. His Highness took a risk. He also took a risk in uh, having me in, uh, in the team. We were not more than five prior to the announcement of Dubai Multi Commodity Center, at that time Dubai Metals Commodity Center. We were uh, board directors who walked Went, traveled around the world, looked at different uh, industries, whether it's industrial, whether it's trade, whether it's uh, JCK show in Vegas. We left nothing to chance and we took what can work for Dubai and what, what are the gaps in Dubai, what are the priorities. I'm now wondering why I'm holding this paper because I'm not reading from it. Um, this is all prior to the announcement, about seven months or so. And yes, the Lakers won their second championship when I uh, was in JCK show. I was watching it in, I think, Venetian. They had a big show in the Venetian hotel. And I met uh, the late uh, Tafiq Farah, who used to head the uh, diamond department. Tafiq Farah is the man with the concept of Dubai Cut Diamond, which is exclusively now promoted uh, through Amit Damani, Damani Jewelry. The diamond has no history. These diamonds have no history of conflict or blood because it's produced in Yakutia, uh, Russia. That's why I recognize the mine behind uh, when it was showed in the picture. <laughs> um, it's manufactured by Smolensk, uh, in Smolensk by Crystal, the second largest manufacturer in the world. But we had to Arabize it. How did we do that? By uh, having 99 facets on on the diamond, which is inspired by the 99 names of Allah from the Quran. That's the Dubai Cut Diamond. Tafiq Farah played a huge role in that. In fact, it was his concept. And he passed away, I believe, not uh, about eight months ago in Johannesburg. Um, we leave nothing to chance. A big opportunity, a small opportunity, a sentimental opportunity. We, we look at Dubai as a map for the commodities industry and we leave nothing to chance. If it's available in the market, we won't touch it. Uh, if the market needs more diamond financing, we work with the local banks, we try to work things out. It has nothing to do with the recession. The diamond financing was facing challenges way before the credit crunch even started. But as the credit crunch started, people made jokes about uh, ABN AMRO saying that the purchase being sold to RBS, I can't recall the other bank that uh, bought it, RBS and Fortis. The amount that was sold for, and after the recession, everybody's uh, is smart, I guess, when they look back at history. This should have been done, and that should have been. Well, where were you when this is happening? In any case, they, you know, they were saying that amount, they could have bought, what, four American car dealership, three baseball uh, clubs, and it goes on. I think if anyone is in the Black, Blackberry uh, community would have seen these jokes. In any case, uh, Abin Amaro seems to be back. Antrop Diamond is there, still around. And uh, the challenges they face has nothing to do with the business. It has to do more with the European winters, which um, I'm not entitled to talk about very much, but if you read the papers and see what's going on, you'll probably know more than I do. Um, because we live in a different era where the Western media don't cover the media. We all cover the media, tweets, social media, alternative media. Even Africa, Zimbabwe, they all have their own papers, they all have, and their voices are heard. People would like to get sources from different areas, and guess what? They draw their own conclusion. Uh, talking about the journey, so where did, I, where did we start? It was a small, I think, three desks in the uh, main base of the customs building. It didn't last very long because His Highness wasn't, upset, wasn't happy about that. So we moved to what was called Kinda House, today known as Al-Attar Business Tower. 
We had a full floor there. We moved to the fourth floor of Emirates Tower to be close to Dubai World as we were incubated by them, not part of Dubai World. It is a free zone that would stand alone. It is a free zone that uh, I wouldn't compare to DIFC, but it's independent just as the DIFC is. But we fall under the federal government. The exchanges under the regulator, uh, Golden Commodity Exchange is regulated under ESCA, Emirates Security and Commodity Authority. And to be honest with you, that's the best thing we've done because the speed they move at is phenomenal and the speed we move at is pretty much synchronized with their speed. And without them, there wouldn't have been currency pairs on Dubai Golden Commodities Exchange. Without them, plastics would have not been launched today. And this is not to uh, bash DFSA, but their response, we applied to both. And ESCA said, we'll see you next week. DFSA said, we'll look at, we will read your letter in six months. So you tell me who to pick. Um, and, and actually, I was, ha I was happy that that's the response because it makes you wonder if we do go with them, what else will come up? But that was the old DFSA. I'm sure things have changed. I think they've had three to five management changes since they've been established. Going forward, uh, subject at hand here, and I'm sure the MC has a lot of questions while I'm talking here and probably he's writing notes. Uh, I promise to make this short, so I'll try to fast forward. We seeded a number of initiatives. We seeded the Dubai Tea Trading Center and some small media that know something or the few that care about writing about tea said Dubai will take, take away Mombasa as the tea hub. Less than a year, Kenyan Tea Trading Authority became a member of the Dubai Tea Trading Center. First few shipments, people were laughing at the shipments. They're too small. Just as they were laughing when His Highness announced that uh, in a short time, Dubai will, will have around 50% of gold coming through it. Well, guess what? More than 25% of gold comes through Dubai, and DMCC plays a huge role. And this is not, and we have not seen anything yet as... Kaluti is building the largest gold refinery, and that's not yet built. There is Emirates Gold Refinery, there is Al-Gharir Giga Gold Refinery, and a few others that are operational around the UAE and in DMCC. Um, we've launched the UAE Gold Bullion Coins. There is no modern Arab country that has its own gold bullion coin, and the central bank t today, as of today, are studying in ways of making that a legal tender. The images, of course, His Highness Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the president of UAE, with the back, with, and that at the back is Burj Khalifa. Now, the story behind that is that I couldn't get this done because we couldn't get one image that encompasses the UAE until Amar announced the rebranding of Burj Dubai to Burj Khalifa. And within that night or the next night, I patented the concept of the gold bullion coin with the image and all that. So that's the speed I, I move in. I was happy for the announcement, but I was even happier that they named it Burj Khalifa because nothing says UAE and named after the president as the tallest tower in the world. So that's how it started. The second one is His Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Maktoum, Vice President, Prime Minister of UAE, ruler of Dubai with the palm on the other side because the palm has multiple, uh, multiple icons in it and uh, monuments. Uh, uh, you have the, uh, which shouldn't happen, but you have Atlantis. So Curzon does not repeat any miracle project. That's his rule. But what he told my father when they met in Royal Mirage, that he checks out all his hotels, So Curzon. And you know, my father said, you know, Sheikh Mohammed and I said, Dubai are building the, um, an island, and we'd like you to be part of it. And we really like your Atlantis concept. And so I said, well, you know, I don't repeat projects. If you look at all of his projects, it's one time. Everything is one time. I guess it's a philosophy he has. But he said, you know what? If this mad project does happen, I will bring you uh, Atlantis. And what happened was not only he constructed Atlantis, he had the rooms and some of the toys already built before the Atlantis were built, and he plugged them in. That's how efficient Saul Kersner is when it comes to construction. And efficiency is a key word when, we talk, when I'll be talking about the expansion and the world tallest office tower, which will have uh, an interesting impact on the economy of UAE, as DMCC is doing today. The expansion will, be, will have more office space than the World Trade Center and DIFC put together. And I am assuming more business than the DIFC and World Trade Center put together as well. Yes, it's a very challenging statement. And... Uh, 
I don't think I'll get hate mails. I, get, I expect them to raise the level of competition. And the more competition there is, it breeds more quality. That's what we want from Dubai. Coming back to, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the experience and the learning curve of building over 66 towers, and when it's all said and done, before the expansion, mind you, um, it would be, I believe, around 80 towers or so. Uh, there is nothing that's missing within that community, from a multi-use park with an amphitheater that's welcomed by all of the companies and the people who live and reside in JLT. In fact, there are people driving from Ras Al Khaimah all the way to JLT. Reason being, a lot of the FMB and retails are new. They get to see the real Dubai. They don't get to see the franchises that they see everywhere else. So they feel they're in a different environment. Doesn't matter whether it's summer or not. Um, we announced recently the construction of Athman bin Affan uh, Mosque, and the, it will be inspired with the um, Umayyad Andalusian design. And I've been to Spain recently, and I found out that my uh, one of my in-laws built an Andalusian mosque in Morocco. He could have saved me the time, but uh, we're getting uh, the, Umayyad, the Umayyad dynasty ruled most of the old world in, uh, in the heydays. So their, their, their marks are all, all over, from the borders of China all the way to, I think they, the closest they got was 60 kilometers to Paris. So in any case, we have a lot of mosques that we can look at. Uh, one of the things that's, I'm talking about the mosque, but it's, there's a part of efficiency in that mosque. There will not be one pillar inside that mosque. The balance will be within the walls. Even for the women's prayer area on top, there will be a wall that separates the majority of prayers and the people who pray at the back from our prayers and all that. So you will not see one pillar. It's not needed. These pillars, maybe in the old days, were required for reinforcement and all that. But we are approaching 2014. For goodness sake, we don't need those pillars. It's one floor, not 50 floors. Uh, it's going to be efficient. And Al-Qawqaf wants it to be, and I'm, I'm supporting that to be uh, a green mosque, a self-sustainable mosque. And I'm so bullish about that mosque that I'm, I, I, became the I, I was honored to be the first donor of one million dirhams to the, to the Uthman ibn Affan Mosque. That's how much I care about the community of Jumeirah Lake Towers. That's how much I like it to be a complete package. Um, by the year end, I think I mentioned we're, we're approaching 8,000 companies. I'll touch on the expansion a little bit more. It's 1,700 square meters. It will add 50% more, uh, more of commercial space. Uh, the existing is 743 and 224 square meters. To the ex uh, that's what it is, to the existing 2.9 uh, million square meters of built-up area. World Tour Star will make these numbers, I guess. Um, we're also going to start construction on JLT-1, probably one of the widest tower buildings you'll see. The, Every floor plate is so wide that people can put in a lot of businesses in, in that area. Um, the, and this is, not, uh, this is not a show. This is not, we didn't work that way. Our best years started from the recession onwards, as the MC mentioned. And we'll explain why uh, when he asked the question as well. I'd like, I'd like to keep some questions for him. Uh, but it's, it's more to do with demand than anything else. And sometimes preempting the DM the coming demand. I mean, if you can, if you can preempt the uh, coming demand, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a tool that not many have, and we noticed that as, as we progressed. Um, I mentioned the tea. A few years ago, the re-export of tea from Dubai, and when we say re-export, it's di distribution from, as a hub, became the second largest in the world. In the last two years, and even today, it's the number one in the world. As far as diamonds are concerned, this is untapped market for diamond industry. And I had to work with the customs to lift the duty and provide also in, co in, in uh, cooperation with the Ministry of Economy during Sheikh uh, Faham al Qasimi time, later on Sheikh Alubna, and now Al Mansouri. So, uh, His Excellency Al Mansouri. Um, that was also established. These two key things were important. Aside from marketing, aside from providing the tallest office tower in the Middle East, which got sold out to end users in a matter of few hours. Now, as much as this was successful, it costed a lot of other people some jobs in other property areas. Uh, two of the 
biggest property tycoons in Dubai had to restructure because they, they had enough of excuses. How could DMCC with no background sell off the tallest office tower to end users through an Oracle system? And while we're getting forecasts of six months, you're telling us forecasts of six months, tw 12 months, and if CBRE around, are around here, I'm going to say it, I don't care. CBRE said, you'd be lucky if you sell 20% in one week. I didn't see their face for about years into it. I think the management changed a few times and then they came back to Almas and we're in discussion with all the experts. I listen to everyone. People who have background, don't have background, we draw our own conclusion. Um, why am I bullish about the expansion? When Almas Tower was sold out to end users in a matter of few hours, and mind you, the gold tower was sold out the next day. Silver Tower, we purposely slowed down. We were much more selective, even though these companies fit the criteria of commodity and diamond business and jewelry businesses. Why am I bullish about the expansion? Very simple. When the Elmas Tower was sold out to end users in a matter of few hours, we were only 400 members. Can you imagine when we, when we pass over 8,000 or 9,000 companies, what kind of promotion, what kind of reach we have? And that's without traveling the world, without promoting the world. Because Dubai is a hub and not even Silk Road. Silk Road is what it used to be. Now it's more of a spider.